Let's set the scene, okay? It's 2007, it's a weekend, and you don't want to do anything more than go to the shopping centre all day with your friends and peruse through the racks of Limited 2 and Claire's accessories. So you get up, you're ready to go, you've put a CD in your CD player, you use hair mascara to get ready, you put on some frosted lipstick, you put in those, you remember those rubbery, spiky earrings from Claire's accessories? You flip through your older sister's issue of Teen Magazine and pull out all all of the posters of the Jonas Brothers and Zac Efron, and you finish off your look with capri pants, a crop top, flat forms, and a little handbag. And you Please. beg your dad to use the family computer, family computer throwback, so you can message your friends on MSN asking them what they're up to and if they wanna go to the mall with you. Times were so much simpler, right? Hello everybody, I hope you're all well. And yes, new background, new background dropped, new background dropped. So I'm actually recording this in my new studio. I have a studio where I work, like use it as an office. And this is also gonna be where I'm recording my podcast episodes. If you don't follow my podcast, link down below, obviously it's actually really good. I was gonna continue filming at home because this scripted videos is a little bit more I, it's not really stressful, but it is a bit overwhelming. I was gonna continue filming at home, but all of my equipment was here. I had to film this video today. So came into the office on a Saturday, what am I like? Sorry, I'm trying to like bring back the messy bun because slicking back my hair is actually making my hair break off. Um, and I'm not sure how I feel about it. Let me know which background you guys prefer. If you like this one or if you like the one at home. This is a work in progress. I really need to put a light bulb in this lab. I'm also gonna put some posters up. I actually posted a picture of my studio on my Instagram story and someone said it looked like I was in prison. But yes, let me know what you guys think. Happy new year, etc. New year, new me, la la la. But what we're going to be talking about today is I saw a tweet and also multiple TikToks about the 12 year old storming Sephora. And I saw the discourse all over Twitter, all over TikTok. And of course, me being me, I wanna chime in. And I also got a few messages from you guys asking me to cover this tweet and this phenomenon in general, because this tweet does represent a wider feeling felt by a lot of millennials and older Gen Z, that it seems to be that the younger generation, Gen Alpha, go from being a child to being a teenager like that. There is seems to be a lack of that in-between area, also known as the tween. And people are arguing that tweens have become obsolete these days, often referring to the death of tween magazines like Bliss and Miz and all also Shout Magazine, and also the decline in tween fashion brands like Delia's and Limited 2 as a representation that there is no such thing as a tween anymore. People are just jumping from adults Sorry, I'm tilted. Sorry, I was I was at an angle. But people seem to jump from being children to being teenagers like that. And there is that lack of tween era. What happened to the tweens? And it's not just this Sephora tweet that caught my attention. Also, someone posted then 13 year old niece's Christmas wish list and look, do I have many a thoughts and opinions about posting your 13 year old niece's Christmas wish list onto TikTok knowing the response that it's gonna get? Yeah, well, yes. but that's a different conversation for a different day. That's a little bit weird. But someone posted a picture of their niece, 13 year old niece's Christmas wish list, and it was full of Charlotte Tilbury, Dior lip oil, ice facial globes, drunk elephant bronzing drops, Jisoo, Gisu, lip gloss, skims. And I have seen some complaints on TikTok about the 12 year old storming Sephora with hundreds of thousands of likes, thousands of comments, millions of views saying that tweens and teenagers these days are so rude and apparently there is a real shift in the way that teenagers and tweens and children behave. And a lot of people boil it down to social media and gentle parenting. And we all know me here. Obviously, I already find this interesting off the bat. In the past 10 years, there has definitely been a shift in tween culture, as we've seen in the decline of tween magazines and tween fashion brands, you know, bands, activities. But on the other hand, it is not new at all for older generations to be extremely hypercritical of the 
the generation beneath them. Between 600 to 300 BC, it was recorded in ancient Greek text that older Greeks used to complain about the younger generations, saying that they were becoming tyrants, they were contradicting their parents, and they were eating the best treats at the table. And one of my mutuals, Ruby, messaged me and told me that when reading came about, reading and writing instead of things being passed along by word of mouth, there was like a moral panic over reading and writing and older generations were worried about younger generations reading too much. With this knowledge, I am acutely aware of when older generations complain about younger generations, it mimics that of a moral panic. So I'm gonna explore this decline in tween culture today and whether there's any truth to it or whether it is just yet another moral-esque, moral panic-esque situation of, oh, teenagers these days, kids these days. And just before we get into it, I would love to thank Milanote for sponsoring another video of mine. If you guys know me, you know how much I love using Milanote to organize my creative project. It is, truly is the perfect tool. I love using Milanote to help create my video essays. And one of the questions that I am asked the most easily is how do I even get the ball rolling? How do I make my videos? How do I turn a thought from one tweet into an entire 5,000 word script? And ever since I started making video essays, like literally three, four years ago, I start out every single video with just a massive, brainstorm, brain dump onto paper. And using Milanote has really helped streamline this process and truly get the creative juices flowing. With my Milanote boards, I can collect images, notes, articles, tasks, and more all in one place. And one of my favorite features with Milano is the web clipper. It's a browser extension and it makes collecting images from the web and putting them onto your Milano boards so easy. I gather my inspiration from all corners of the internet. So being able to put them all in one Milanote board and really visually see it, it really does speed up my creative process so much. And Milanote doesn't just need to be used for creating video essays. They have over 100 different templates for their boards to use for a range of different creatives. If you're a writer, a filmmaker, a podcaster, an artist, a designer, a photographer, if you aspire to be in any kind of creative line of work, Milanote really is the tool for you. Milanote can also be used to collaborate on your projects as well. You just have to share them with your team members and they can leave comments, make alterations to your board, provide feedback, and also just engage with the content on your board as well. For me, that's really important because I have an editor, you guys all know Cathy, um, and I often share my Milanote boards with her so she gets an idea of what I am going for with my videos. And also it's really helpful for her in the editing process to see all the articles that I'm using and referencing. And Milanote is available to download for free with absolutely no time limit. So make sure you guys click my link in the description, my link in the description to download Milanote today and get started on your next creative project. And please let me know in the comments how you guys get on. Thank you again, Milanote, for sponsoring this video and let's get into it. The word tween originated in the mid 90s and it basically is a catch-all term for the ages of nine to 13. You know, a tween, you're a bit too old to be a child, but you're also a bit too young to be a teenager. You're between tween. Yes, I did not know that tween was short for between. You learn something new every day. And the word tween is actually, interestingly enough, it's actually a marketing term. Marketers, market researchers realized the true power of the tween demographic when it came to their shopping habits and also the fact that they had a lot of influence over their parents' shopping habits as well. To quote The Truth About Tweens, a 1999 article by Pat Winger, tweens are also a retailer's dream. Consumers with a seemingly insatiable desire for the latest in everything, from old navy cargo pants to limp biscuit CDs. Their influence goes beyond their closets. Tweens, Leonardo DiCaprio fans were a force behind the phenomenal success of Titanic, as well as groups like the Backstreet Boys. 10 to 14 year olds now account for about 9% of all CD sales. They're a huge part of the audience of the WB network, which has made a specialty of creating programs that appeal to tweens, 18.5% of its audience, along with their older siblings. They're also the target consumers of magazines like YM and Teen People. McNeil estimates that tweens had direct influence over the 128 billion dollars in family spending in 1997 with the same 
play in all kinds of purchases, from soft drinks to cars. Kids invented the minivan, says McNeil, and just recently they've been encouraging their parents to sell them and get an SUV instead. I feel like I set the scene pretty well earlier talking about tween culture, but the beauty of tween culture is that it's different for everyone, depending what generation you are and what year you were born in. When I was setting the scene of, you know, 2007, I do feel like my tween years were the very early 2010s. I was around 12 or 13 in the 2000, in the early 2010s. So I feel like I was maybe a little bit too young to relate to like Backstreet Boys and sync and using hair mascara. No offense to the hair mascara fans in the room, but my experience as a tween was. Uh, <laughs> so I was a tween slash a very young teenager in the very early 2010s, just as social media was beginning to play a small but very novelty part in our lives. Instagram had just launched and everyone was first of all posting absolutely everything, bring back casual Instagram. And everyone was editing their Instagram pictures using the Instagram filters or Retrika. By the way, seeing Addison Ray using an iPhone 5 and editing her pictures with the Instagram filters healed me in ways I did not believe was possible from an influencer. The girlies were listening to One Direction or The Wanted or Five Seconds of Summer. I don't believe in Five Seconds of Summer erasure in this house. The girlies were also collecting EOS lip balms or Maybelline baby lips. The fashion at the time was florals, American flag printed everything, Jeffrey Campbell liters, also studded everything, Paul's boutique bags. All right, this is getting a little bit British centric but I loved my Paul's Boutique bag. I was also obsessed with Zoella and the Brit crew when I was 14 which was again the early 2010s and it was when they just started to take off and I literally used to watch their VidCon vlogs like it was my Super Bowl like with multiple points of view <laughs> and this is really again British centric quite random but I was absolutely like when I think of being a early teen and a tween I think of Shout magazine did anybody else here used to read Shout magazine I wanted to buy an issue for this video but people are selling them for slightly ludicrous prices like I'm not going to spend 25 pounds on a Shout magazine from 2011 but if we get back onto the subject at hand the decline in tween culture the alleged decline in tween culture. People are often referring to three different things when they talk about this. Tween magazines, tween fashion, and tween physical spaces slash third spaces. And I want to explore these three claims today, mostly the first two, but we're going to conclude with the third one. But I do think that it's very important to, let's go back, let's take it back now, y'all, and discuss adults' attitudes towards tweens in the 90s and early 2000s. Because as tweens ourselves, we often look back on being a tween and tween culture with rose-tinted glasses on because we weren't the adults in the situation. But let's explore the tween moral panic. The original tween moral panic. As I was researching this video, I was going in. I was going in and I was scouring all corners of the internet. And let me tell you, I found some absolute gems. I was reading a lot of articles from the 1990s and I found this article, which I can only describe as absolutely brilliant for my research. It was written in 1998 by K.S. Heimowitz and it's titled, Tweens 10 Going On 16. As the authority of parents wanes, preteens are falling under the weight of peer groups and marketers. The disquieting result, hip and sex. 10 year olds. This article was absolutely perfect for my research because it proved exactly what I was thinking that tween spaces in the 90s and early 2000s weren't these safe spaces for kids to be kids that we think of them as and we look back on them as. The conception of the word tween came with a moral panic about tweens and concerns that the creation of the word tween as an age bracket was going to force 
10 year olds to grow up way too quickly. This article is full of absolute gems. It's funny reading this article back in the 2020s because a lot of these tweens that Heimowitz is referring to who are wearing crop tops and listening to boy bands and watching TV shows that involve romantic relationships and wearing makeup. I'm sure a lot of them turned out absolutely fine. They're probably all in their 30s now. Maybe they've got kids of their own. I'm going to read some excerpts for you guys, but I do just want to say that this was very tough to whittle down, but I'm going to leave it linked down below so you guys can have a read of it as well because it proved my point a little too perfectly. Those who remember their own teeny bopper infatuation with Elvis or the Beatles might be inclined to shrug their shoulders as if to say, it was never thus. But this is different. Across class lines and throughout the country, elementary and middle school principals and teachers, child psychologists and psychiatrists, marketing and demographic researchers all confirmed the pronouncement of Henry Trevor, middle school director of Berkeley Carroll School in Brooklyn, New York. There is no such thing as pre-adolescence anymore. Kids are teenagers at 10. Marketers have a term for the new social animal. Kids between 8 and 12. They call them tweens. The name captures the ambiguous reality. Though chronologically midway between early childhood and adolescence, this group is leaning more and more towards teen styles, teen attitudes, and sadly, teen behavior at its most troubling. They're very concerned with their look, friend says, even more so than older teens. Sprouting up everywhere are clothing stores like Chain Limited 2 and the catalog company Delia's, geared towards tween girls who scorn old-fashioned little girl flowers, ruffles, white socks, and Mary Janes in favor of the cool, black mini dresses and platform shoes. In Toronto, a tween store called Chickaboom, which offers a manicurist and tween singing Star Jewel on the sound system hypes itself as an adventure playground where girls can hang out, have fun, and go nuts shopping. Less cosmopolitan tweens may askew the understated little black dress, but they are fashion mad in their own way. Teachers complain of 10 or 11 year old girls arriving at school looking like madams in full cosmetic regalia with streaked hair, platform shoes, and midriff revealing shirts. Barbara Kapitanakis, a psychologist at a conservative Jewish day school in New York describes her student skirts as being about the size of a belt. Kapitaneka says she was told to dress respectfully on Fridays, the eve of the Jewish Sabbath, which she did by donning a long skirt and a modest blouse. Her students, on the other hand, showed their respect by looking like they'd been hanging around the West Side Highway where prostitutes ply their trade. I will leave it here, but I will leave the video, the, video, the article linked down below if you guys wanna have a read of it yourselves. As you guys can probably tell, older generations tend to have moral panics over younger generations and it often relates to the pop to popular culture at the time and also to new developments in technology and this isn't me trying to say that we should dismiss every concern that people have over gen alpha heimowitz actually raises some very valid concerns such as eating disorders being rife amongst young girls um increased alcohol and drug consumption by teenagers but her complaints never seem to come from a genuine place of concern for children's well-being she literally spends the entire Entire article berating children and seemingly blames these very complex issues on belly tops, platform shoes, hair mascara, and Will Smith being on the cover of Nickelodeon magazine. There are absolutely valid concerns with the fact that Gen Alpha are growing up with social media and how that impacts their psychology and their well being and their self image and how screen time impacts everyone, not just just children's attention spans and also there's concerns for the fact that children don't really have anything to do these days and the loss and lack of third places but people grown ass adults referring to children as bitch face monsters on tiktok their complaints about the younger generation are not coming from a place of real concern for children it literally just comes from a place of hating that children are inconveniencing them hating children in general actually and wanting to berate children on a public platform and have other adults join in and validate their dislike for children which is just what K.S. Heimowitz did with their article. I am going to circle back onto the whole 
anti-children, kids these days vibe of this entire situation. But before we get into that, I did want to talk about the decline of tween culture. So the decline of tween magazines and also the decline of tween fashion. Because the decline of tween culture is not alleged, right? There is, it's not anecdotal the way that the 12 year olds who are storming Sephora is an anecdotal uh story. <laughs> Between fashion brands like Delia's, Limited 2, Kai's Accessories, Aeropostale have all filed for bankruptcy and tween magazines, Elle Girl, Cosmo Girl, Jump and Teen People have shut down and Teen Vogue and Seventeen Magazine have moved online. Does this signify the death of tween culture or is tween culture simply evolving? Let's explore. Let's look into it. <laughs> Clothing brands and stores which once ruled teens and tweens everywhere. At its height, Delia sent over like, I think it was like a whopping 55 million copies of their catalog a year. The fact that these brands that were so successful, just a mere... 15, 20 years ago would eventually file for bankruptcy. It's insane, right? Like it's insane. But also I do think it's important to note that a lot of these brands came at a real pivotal time for clothing retail, the inception of the internet, where all of a sudden brands had to build an online presence for themselves. And I know it sounds easy now, like looking back at it, but at that time, barely anybody had done it. And there was really no available guidance for brands and clothing companies. So many clothing brands, not just tween clothing brands, failed to keep up and went under because of like this dramatic shift. Delia's is different from the average clothing retail in the 90s. Sorry, my bang. I know I'm playing with it a lot. I'm sorry. Delia's is a brand that differs a lot to the average tween brand of the 90s because there were no brick and mortar stores. It was all through done through catalog. Throwback to catalogs. Bring back catalogs. Bring back the Argos catalog. So they would sell all of their clothing through mail to order catalogs. And not only did they function the catalog sort of to be a catalog magazine where young girls would like have sleepovers and circle all the bits and bobs that they wanted. It became a real act activity. And also, may I just say that Delia's catalogs were cute as fuck. Bring back Delia's. They would send out their mail catalogs roughly 10 to 12 times a year. And a lot of Delia's success was down to its branding, which Evan Nicole Brown describes as playfully irreverent and quirky. The forward thinking brand identity right on time for the new decade to come epitomized young girlhood in the 90s. Casual, creative, and a little bit awkward with puberty and possibility. But also the catalog business model really worked for Delia's. As I said earlier, it definitely functioned more as a catalog magazine hybrid where teen girls could make a real activity of it, a real day of it, where they could have a sleepover, circle all the bits and bobs they wanted. But also it functioned really well as a sales tool because a lot of teenage girls would basically use the article to sell the clothing to their parents. So they'd be like, please get me this. I really want it. It looks like this. This girl looks so cool, which was a really different experience than going to the mall with your mum and shopping at usually the clothing stores that she chose for you. And it's really unfortunate that Delia's seem to fall in a real awkward in-between space of being too young to experience the height of 80s mall culture, but also too old to really get into a good swing with their online presence. To quote Jim Tratska for Fast Company, the web became a big deal. So we started having a website with imagery and stuff. Then it moved to e-commerce, says Tratska. What really changed the brand was when they tried to dabble in to brick and mortar stores. I don't think they had the infrastructure and it's very expensive. A lot of resources went to that, which kind of hurts the print side as well. They just couldn't translate the magic of print to stores. And to quote directly from the article again, when Delia's was acquired by Alloy Inc. in 2003 for $50 million, the internet and e-commerce was finding its footing. Though Delia's always had a digitally influenced web 1.0 look, it was difficult for the team to adjust to the rapidly evolving e-commerce landscape. There was very little president or information available on how to build a thriving retail site online. And there are other reasons as to why tween fashion brands failed. I read a really informative article on Teen Vogue about it. By the way, Teen Vogue absolutely slaps. I reference them a lot in my videos. And one thing they discuss is the tween age bracket. Not only is the tween age bracket a very small one, it's between the ages of nine to 14. 14 is pushing it too, but it's also constantly changing 
tweens become teens and then children become tweens. And it's basically a revolving door because it's such a small age bracket. Tweens become teens and they often move on very quickly. And then all of a sudden within the space of five years, there is a new generation of tweens that like completely different things and have completely different tastes. Teen Vogue described it as basically having to do customer acquisition every five years, which is insane and it's not a sustainable business model. It's actually far more of a sustainable business model to have your target market instead of being tweens be young people. You can expand your age demographic from nine to 14 to nine to 30. And one thing I noticed whilst researching for this video and writing this script is that a lot of fashion brands, like modern day, very successful fashion brands, do remind me a lot of these tween brands. So when it comes to Delia's, I think Urban Outfitters really resembles Delia's. And I think that Brandy Melville really resembles Limited too. And if I'm being honest, I would wear most of the things in the Delia's catalog now. And I'm in my mid twenties. I think not only could tween clothing brands not keep up with the tweens of the 2010s, but also social media has a huge impact. Social media has absolutely played a huge part in who we know as the tween today. Like I'm gonna circle more back to this when I start talking about tween magazines. But if we just talk about like the tween economy, it's no longer reading a tween magazine, seeing a picture of Ashley Tisdale and wanting to recreate her look. It's now as a tween, you follow social media influencers and you want to wear exactly what they're wearing and they can link it in their TikTok shop or their Amazon storefront. And it's no longer trying to dress like a celebrity. It's literally now shopping from your favorite influencer. And popular clothing brands for tweens in the early 2020s is Amazon, Shein, Zara, H&M, and Lululemon, which again is frequented by adults as well. Also TikTok is a complete hub for trends and cause. And the interesting thing about TikTok is that even though it was an app initially made for children, it has a real wide age range of people on that app. So when we talk about really popular TikTok aesthetics and trends and cores like clean girl aesthetic, I've seen vanilla girl floating around as well. Tomato girl, <laughs> coastal grandma. I feel like that Bridget Mendelin meme when she turns really old when I talk about stuff like this. Most likely the people who are partaking in these trends and aesthetics are women in their twenties, but also Ch teenagers and children. So teenagers, children, and adults are all getting their trend forecasting and their cause and aesthetics and their inspiration from the same place. So everyone is beginning to dress the same. Tween brands have dissipated and clothing brands are beginning to cater between the age ranges of 10 to 30. For the first time, possibly ever, children, teenagers, and adults are all occupying the same leisure spaces. The only difference is that is not a physical space it's social media. Talking about the decline of teenage magazines actually makes me kind of sad. As I mentioned earlier, I was a huge fan of Shout Magazine. Fun fact, I remember I bought an article, an issue of Shout Magazine, and on the cover, there was an article about a girl that would get sent makeup for free, and she was a beauty blogger. And I read that article, and it made me start a blog myself. And starting a beauty blog got me into beauty blogging, which then got me into YouTube. So would I be here if it wasn't for Shout Magazine? Maybe not. The Shout Magazine magazine reader to video essayist pipeline. If you weren't around for tween magazines, let me paint a picture for you. These magazines were brightly colored and glossy. Usually a celebrity adorned the cover and these magazines had pages and pages of celebrity gossip and interviews, heartthrobs, including pull out posters you could stick on your bedroom walls, advice columns about awkward tween issues like puberty, periods, friendships, boys, parents, school. There was loads of fashion, hair and makeup advice. And one thing which really stood out to me with tween magazines is that there was a lot of contribution from readers of the magazines and a lot of submissions, whether it was to the magazine's agony aunt, whether it was embarrassing stories. I remember Shout Magazine used to publish like these real and true emotionally hard hitting stories. And one that I remember so vividly was this girl wrote into Shout Magazine and said that she was in love with Robert Pattinson and that it wasn't just like 
like a regular celebrity crush like she genuinely felt like she would never be happy because she knows that she would never be with Robert Pattinson and I'm like you know what that's actually so relatable babes <laughs> like she was so real for that and also another hard-hitting true story that I remember that oh my god it actually gives me anxiety just thinking about it was this girl said that she uh had made a boyfriend on holiday like she had a boyfriend um that she met I think when she went to Turkey or something and she carried on texting him with her phone um and it ran up her phone bill to like a thousand pounds <laughs> and this was like back in the day guys like this story was so 2010 core because back in the day when you used to accidentally click on that internet button on your phone it was enough to induce an anxiety attack now something which i think is very important to note whilst discussing the death and decline of tween magazines is that there has been a huge decline in print media Anyways, this year, another large printer in the UK shut down, leaving just one large magazine printer in the UK. Sorry, I'm laughing because I'm not laughing at the death of uh, print media. I'm laughing because when I'm saying large printer, I'm literally just thinking of a physically large printer. I mean, like a factory. Between 2010 and 2022, the number of print titles purchased has declined by 70% from around £1 billion annually to just over three. 300 million pounds annually and consumer spend on print magazines has dropped from 1.4 billion pounds in 2010 to less than 500 million pounds in 2022. The publishing house futures market value has dropped by 4.7 billion pounds to 800 million pounds and according to Group M the UK magazine ad market is going to continue to decline to just 378 million pounds in 2027. I think you all know this now but the decline of print media is attributed to technological advancements. A majority of people get their news online, they read newspapers online, magazines online, but mostly people get their news from social media. I get my news from social media, I get a lot of my news from Twitter. You know, the homepage of Twitter, their favourite political TikToker who is going to deliver the information that they want to know in a clear, concise and engaging way. And not only that, but it's delivered to them for free. And before we get into the decline of tween magazines, I do actually believe, I have a hunch, I do actually believe that we are going to see a comeback of print media nowhere near as big as it used to be in the 2000s and the 90s and before then obviously but I do actually think we are going to see an increase in print media I think that people are going to really start valuing owning a physical copy of like an independent magazine you know stuff like that like obviously we're not going to see the comeback of like celebrity gossip magazines but I do think we're going to see a comeback of independent magazines similarly to how we saw a comeback of vinyls because they're multifaceted they're multifunctional like you can use them as uh decorations in your <laughs> but anyways, back onto the topic at hand. Similarly to all forms of print media, the decline of tween magazines can be boiled down to technolo technological advancements and the introduction and rise of social media. People not only choose to read news outlets online, but people often get their news and celebrity gossip from social media sites like Twitter and TikTok. So why would teenagers and children be any different? Instead of buying an issue of a teen magazine every week, they will just follow all of their favorite influences on TikTok. You know, getting fashion, hair, beauty recommendations, and also getting general life advice in general. A lot of influencers give life advice and will do like agony aunts and Q and A's, you know, story time as well, which is actually pretty similar content to teen magazines. And also a lot of tweens follow other tweens on TikTok and social media. There's a lot of like teenage influencers and tween age influencers as well. And I do think it's a good thing that tweens are going to other tweens for advice, but just because we're acknowledging the evolution of tween spaces and the evolution of the tween in general does not mean that we still can't mourn the tween space. There was a level of safety and security within the tween magazine space because all the information that was being published was being vetted by adults. You can't just post anything on TikTok and people will believe you. Like, oh my God, if I see one more Femme Fresh ad, do not use Femme Fresh on your bits. And I do also think 
12 year olds frequenting TikTok and using TikTok as entertainment is the reason why we're seeing 12 year olds buy retinoids in Sephora. But we're going to circle back to this in just a moment. But I also do think that maybe we have a tendency to look back on tween magazines with rose tinted glasses. Because remember, as tweens, we weren't just reading tween magazines. We were also reading those horrendous celebrity gossip magazines that our mums used to buy. The ones that were literally just full of berating female celebrities and body shaming them. Tween magazines did not protect tweens from regular magazines. And sometimes the tween magazines weren't giving the most sound advice to teenage girls. But also at the same time, I do think it's really important to point out the danger of algorithms. I think that the TikTok algorithm and the fact that there's a side of TikTok, I spoke about it in my TikTok is bad for women video. There is a side of TikTok that is so hyper obsessed with their physical appearance. You know, what shape their skull is, what kind of face they have, what aesthetic do they fit into, what plastic surgery has XY celebrity had. It's literally just content which is going to make you feel insecure about yourself. And it's so easy to fall into a like, wormhole with that kind of content. And also young boys being radicalized by red pill podcaster misogynists. Oh my God, there is this podcaster who just gets sex workers onto his podcast just to berate them and talk down to them. I have actually never seen anything like it and I have to scroll straight past because I actually, oh my God, it makes me feel so violent because he's so clearly making up for some sort of insecurity going on. You know, he's definitely the type that's, you know, wanking with his right hand and pointing with his left. Now onto the question on everyone's lips. Are the 12 year olds storming Sephora? Now, I wouldn't know because I don't go to Sephora, but I am here to argue that nothing has really changed. The tweens and teens of today wanting to buy expensive makeup and skincare like Drunk Elephant and Charlotte Tilbury and NARS and Glossier is no different from the makeup that I was buying when I was 13. Let's take a trip down memory lane, shall we? When I was 13, I was absolutely obsessed with makeup, obsessed with makeup. Every day when I got home, from school, I would spend hours watching YouTube tutorials, reading beauty blogs. And when I was 13, I would save every single penny of birthday money, Christmas money, pocket money, and I would spend it all on makeup. I could spend hours in boots. I could spend hours in department stores, just playing with and trying all the different makeup. And I used to buy expensive makeup then too. I used to buy drugstore makeup, but I also used to spend a lot of money on MAC, Urban Decay, NARS, Benefit. This sentiment that 12 year olds buying high-end makeup and skincare products is not a new phenomenon because I used to spend a lot of money on makeup and skincare products. I was literally there. And when it comes to skincare, I was literally 14 years old using Liz Earl Cleanser and St. Ives Apricot Scrub. And I have seen people younger than me share anecdotes that when they were tweens and teens, they were tweens during the 2016 King Kylie full glam Instagram makeup era. So they used to spend all of their birthday and Christmas Christmas money on Morphe palettes, Kylie Cosmetics lip kits. They usually literally used to rock up to school when they were 12 years old with a cut crease. 12 years old is a very normal age for children to get into beauty and makeup. The only difference is, is that the trends have changed. Now the trends is the clean girl aesthetic. The clean girl aesthetic is the aesthetic of the early 2020s and children and teenagers want to buy the exact products that their favorite influencers are using. It's the same. It's just the only thing that has changed is the trends and all also the most hyped products. However, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about 12 year olds wanting to buy retinoids to slow down aging when they're 12. But also that's not the 12 year olds fault. Sorry, but if you go onto an app primarily used by children, TikTok and promote your favorite retinoids and acids and completely fear monger your audience about aging, then don't act shocked that 12 year olds are scared of aging and are trying to buy retinoids. You don't get to act shocked that that completely rubs off on children, similarly to how diet culture rubbed off on children in the early 2000s. And I think this entire discourse, to me anyway, really highlighted the way that people talk about children is absolutely deranged and honestly disgusting. I don't know how it has become socially acceptable to talk about children in this way, to refer to children as bitch faced monsters. Considering we were all children once, why are you beefing a 12 year old? 
don't you have better things to do? A majority of the discourse surrounding the 12 year old storming Sephora isn't coming from a place of concern for children. And it isn't coming from a place of, it's such a shame that children don't have anything to do. It's such a shame that children are succumbing to modern day beauty standards. It all just comes from a place of, I don't like children, children inconvenience me. I should not have children in my peripheral vision. And people being anti-children does span across the entire political spectrum. I find that people on the right tend to think of children as a life stage, as something to accomplish, as something which is their purpose, but they never really think of children as individuals with personalities and complex emotions and feelings like they do. And then on the left, people take the, oh, I don't want to have children, which is completely fine. I don't think anybody should have children if they don't want to have children, but they take that not wanting to have children as being annoyed and angry at children being in public spaces and behaving like children. Children having tantrums in public, crying on airplanes, running around, like it literally makes people angry and people are just so hostile towards children behaving like children despite the fact that we were all children once and this hostility towards children not only impacts children but it also impacts their caregivers which a majority of the time are women when spaces are so anti-children they are in turn anti-women and to sort of wrap this video up the reason why so many 12 year olds are hanging out with Sephora not only because it's a completely normal age to get into beauty and makeup but also so there is a real lack of third spaces for everyone, not just for children. If you don't know what a third space slash place is, it's basically a place outside of work slash school and home where you can like spend your leisure time. There is a real lack of free public spaces in the 21st century, especially in the United States. And I think sometimes the only thing that kids can do is go to the mall and hang out at Sephora and play with all the makeup. And look, if they're rude and if they're stealing, then of course they, you know, should have consequences to their actions. But this idea that children are worse now, I don't think is entirely true. And when there is an uptick in youth crime, if we're going down this route, if there is an uptick in youth crime, it usually boils down to circumstances which children cannot control. Things like socioeconomic conditions, um, a poor home life, poor school life, a lack of support from government services like social services and mental health support. And all of these services have been underfunded for upwards of a decade because of the conservative government. And if we stay on this topic just a little while longer, then I'm gonna go. Children not being allowed to exist in public spaces is so often interwoven with classism and racism. Children wearing tracksuits have been banned from shopping centers before in the UK. Children from working class backgrounds or minority ethnic backgrounds or both, um, often them congregating in public spaces is seen as antisocial behavior. You know, to wrap up this video, I just think that we owe our children more. We owe our children more. And it is not normal to talk about children in this way. And once again, I view the 12 year olds at Sephora discourse as yet another moral panic about the younger generations, which I feel like we're all just gonna come out looking a little bit silly. And again, that does not mean that we cannot be concerned about things like social media usage um, and being scared of aging and a lack of third spaces for children to congregate and just be children. But also a lot of these viral TikToks I've seen are not coming from a place of concern at all. It's just coming from a place of wanting to publicly berate children and have other adults validate their hatred to children um, and for children. But yes, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know what you guys think of the background. Maybe I will switch it up and do my next video at home. I'm not sure. Um, but yes, I'll see you guys soon for my next video. Bye.